Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you this morning. Glad that you are able to join us for our second week in a row. We have been able to gather. Glad you are here. And I hope that this time is uplifting to you as we are in the presence of the Lord and also in the presence of each other. I do have one kind of announcement uh, to make, not for uh, today, but for next week. Uh, next week is the 1st of August already. Uh, I don't know about you, but time is flying by for me. Uh, so that means the first Sunday of the month means communion. And we have a special way we are going to do communion. We are not going to ask, we don't have to ask that you bring your own elements. We actually have individually wrapped uh, communion bread and juice for you, factory sealed, uh, sanitized, that you can, uh, will have out available for you next week for communion. So if you were worried at all how we were going to do communion next week, I hope your fears are laid to rest and we will do it safe and um, to the, in, in a proper and safe way uh, and while we still are able to celebrate the Lord's meal together. So I guess that's all I have. Uh, to open our worship this morning, I would like to start with a call to worship from Psalm 105, verse, uh, verses 1 through 7. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to God. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders God has done, his miracles, and the judgments he pronounced. O descendants of Abraham, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord, our God. Let us praise our God. Let us join together in our opening hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. that your promise that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there. We welcome the Holy Spirit to move among us today. We ask that you would open our ears to hear your voice, our minds to receive your wisdom, our spirits to know your leading and guidance, and our hearts to receive your wonderful love. I ask this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
At this time, I invite Susie up for this morning's children's message. Good morning. Looks like I have a lot of young at hearts in here today. <laughs> it's nice to see everybody. Do any of you, or did any of you, have nicknames growing up? Maybe Will is short for William, or Maddie is short for Madeline. Maybe that was your nickname, they, where you just shortened your name. Or maybe it was something you did as a child. Maybe instead of crawling, you scooted, so your nickname became Scooter. Um, or maybe you have a name where it was passed down from your family. Like in my husband's family, Aaron is a popular name that came from his grandfather. And so my husband's middle name is Aaron, and now we have a grandson named Aaron. So have you ever thought about what your name means? Well, sometimes in some cultures, names do have specific meanings, like Malik means king, or Lucy, or Lu short for Lucille, means light. So if you think back a couple of weeks ago to Abraham, his name that God gave him was Abraham, which means father. And then God changed his name to Abraham, which means father of many. So then last week, we learned that Jacob had that dream about climbing the ladder and all of that. So this week, we learned that Jacob wrestled with God for a long time. And in that period, God changed his name. So let's listen to Genesis 32, verse 28, to see what God changed his name to be. Then the man said, or God said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. So the name Israel means struggled with God. So Jacob's name was changed from Jacob to Israel because he struggled with God. I wonder how often if we were given a name by God, if we could be obedient to that. Like, for instance, the name Cody means helpful. Could you live up to that name and always be helpful? Or maybe if your name was Josiah, that means cheerful. So if you were given a name by God or think of a name that you would take on that God would give you, maybe you feel you're obedient. And try and be that person for two or three days and see if you can really live up to that. Um, so what I want all of you to do is maybe trace back what your name really means. Maybe you can go to your parents or find out through Ancestry.com or something what your name really means or if it is a family name, where it came from, or what it means, and see if you can live up to that. So let us pray. Thank you, God, for giving us our names, for giving us our families and parents. Thank you for the stories in the Bible so we can learn what kind of person you want us to be. Bless us this week as summer is coming to an end and soon we will start school. Be with the people who make the decisions for school. Direct them for what is best to keep us safe. Thank you, God, for protecting us. Amen. Thank you. See you next week. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32. 
We continue our story with Jacob and his wrestling match with God. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. At one point growing up, my brother and I were really into professional wrestling. Although they said at the beginning of every telecast, don't try this at home, we always, always did. My brother is over six years older than I, and he's always been bigger and stronger than me. It's hard to believe that someone is bigger than me sometimes, but he, he is, even to this day. He's just a little bit taller than I am, and, and he got all the strength of the family. Especially when he entered high school and he began weightlifting for sports, I didn't stand a chance. Now, when we wrestled at home, my brother would often start off gently and, you know, kind of play with me and, and let me think that I was actually wrestling with him. But eventually he'd start to dominate and he'd get me in some kind of move or some kind of bind. My smile would turn to a frown. My laughter would turn to cries of pain. Not really, but I thought they were. And the wrestling match usually ended with me storming off in anger. Those were the good old days. It's good to be a sports fan today, not only because uh, baseball is back, but be because we get wrestling as the main event in our scripture passage today. In one corner, we have Jacob, the son of Isaac, the grandson of Abraham. And in the other corner, we have the Almighty, the Creator, the Lord. And a quick recap of what has happened in the story so far, Jacob has conned, cheated, deceived, and manipulated virtually every member of his family, and then runs, runs away when things become uh, too tough or too tense or when things are about to explode in his face. To begin with, Jacob deceived his twin brother Esau into selling Esau's birthright as the firstborn son and as well as the, the blessing from their father Isaac. Their mother Rebekah sends Jacob to her brother Laban for safety because Esau wants to kill Jacob. Jacob marries both of Laban's daughters, Leah and Rachel, as well as their servant girls while he is with uh, Laban in Haran. Jacob is forced to remain in Haran and in service to his father-in-law for almost 20 years. And during that time, Jacob fathers 11 sons and possibly one daughter, although we aren't 100% sure when Dinah was born. The relationship between Jacob and his father-in-law Laban becomes quite tense, uh, ultimately because Jacob acquired much of Laban's wealth and livestock. 
God took notice of this tense situation, and so he sent Jacob a message in another dream to return to his homeland and to his father, Isaac. So once again, Jacob is on the run and leaves in the midst of a tense situation. But with him this time goes his two wives and their two servant girls, 11 children, many servants, and a lot of livestock. At this time, Jacob's past is finally catching up to him. Yes, Jacob is on his way home, but that means he has to face his brother Esau, whom Jacob is convinced, even 20 years later, still wants revenge. Right before our passage, Jacob is preparing himself to face Esau. And in his trickster way, Jacob divides his family and servants into two camps and sends them both ahead to meet Esau. He sends them with gifts, hoping to appease Esau's wrath. So basically, Jacob sends his family in front of him almost as a human shield protecting him from his brother. I don't know about you, but this is not exactly, in my opinion, an an honorable thing Jacob has done. But it's in line with his character so far in the narrative. So at the beginning of our passage today, Jacob is at a crossroads, both literally and figuratively. He has arrived at the Jabbok River, which is the boundary between Laban on one side and his brother Esau on the other. He is now in the middle of both his past as well as his future, a place where he believes he faces life or death. Since he sent his family and servants before him, Jacob is now alone, and the night has come, so it is dark. And suddenly, Jacob is attacked by an unknown man. If you are surprised by these events, you are not alone. I am too. These are really strange, a strange turn of events. The author of Genesis gives no indication of who this individual is. And this wrestling match appears to be an equally physical match, an equally physically contest, because the the text tells us that Jacob's opponent cannot overcome him. And in light of the man's ability to cause Jacob's hip to slip out of place so easily at the end of the wrestling match, gives an an appearance or a, a, a insight that this is not merely just a physical contest, but also a spiritual one. So the question is, who is this unknown individual? Well, to be honest, your guess is as good as mine. If this is a spiritual battle, many scholars assume that Jacob is wrestling some kind of a higher being, possibly an angel. Jacob seems to assume he wrestled with God. Since he renames the place, the the wrestling ring he's in, he renames it Peniel, which means uh, face of God. During this wrestling match, Jacob is able to stand his ground in the struggle. And during it, Jacob demands a blessing from the man. And in turn, the man gives Jacob a new name, Israel, which as Susie mentioned earlier, means he struggles with God. We we assume that the blessing this mysterious man gives is Jacob's new name. I think it's noteworthy that what God did when he wrestled with Jacob is, is quite miraculous. Jacob began the night dreading his upcoming meeting with Esau. He was full of fear and desperation. But Jacob ended the night the next morning with God's blessing and a renewed faith all in his possession. And with this change in name, Jacob also has changed his path in life. As previously mentioned, Jacob's character leading up to this moment has not exactly been model worthy. But as Jacob crosses the Jabbok River to meet Esau, he now crosses over into his promised destiny as Israel. 
similar to his grandfather and father before him. Jacob has begun to grow in his character as he grows in his relationship with God. He started as a con man, but now seems to be growing into a, solid, a man of solid faith. And in doing so, he becomes the eponym for the group of people that God calls his own. This story of Jacob wrestling with God is certainly an unusual one in all of Scripture. But the image, I think, of wrestling makes for a good metaphor. Wrestling is grappling with an opponent in order to gain and maintain a superior position. And I think, I know, at one time or another, or in some of our cases, lots of times, we have all wrestled with God. We have wrestled with God because we don't want to give God control of things. We want to be the ones in control. We want to be the ones who are in the driver's seat of our lives. We want to be the ones calling the shots. We want to be in control because we're comfortable with who we are. We're comfortable with where we're at in our lives. We're comfortable with what, our, what we're doing. If we do give control over to God, that means we may have to <gasps> change. We'll have to go where God wants us to go. Do what God wants us to do. Be who God wants us to be. And we're not sure we really want to do that. One of the more memorable times I wrestled with God was right after I graduated from high school. As I've told you numerous times before, I've wanted to be a pastor, a minister, since I was probably four years old. But that summer after high school, I found myself unwilling to give God control. As I thought about leaving my hometown, as I thought about leaving the people that I grew up with and loved, as I thought about leaving the comfortable bubble that I had been in for 19 years at that time, I became afraid. And I wasn't so sure I was willing to go where God wanted me to go. And so for most of that summer, I wrestled with God. I thought, oh sure, yeah, I could, I could go off to college and seminary, I could go off to Omaha, and didn't know that at the time, but eventually Chicago, and, and fulfill God's calling. Or, or maybe I could just stay in, in the hometown of Stanton and, and do what I could there. Doesn't that sound okay, God? When it was finally time to go off to college, God seemed to flick my spiritual hip, and I succumbed and did go off to college. And I believe God has been with me and, and blessed me on my journey so far. Sometimes wrestling with God is painful. Like Jacob's injury to his hip, we, we sometimes are hurt by wrestling with God. But those hurts lead to healing. It's like the surgeon's wound. wound. Yes, it initially hurts, but the surgeon cuts to heal. Yes, it hurt at the time to leave the life that I was comfortable with behind. But if I hadn't submitted to God, I honestly have no idea where I would be, what I would be doing right now. I know I wouldn't be here, that's for sure. What are you wrestling with God about? What blessing do you want from God? What frustration do you have regarding God's plan for your life? What control issue do you not want to hand over? What fear or burden are you clinging to instead of turning it over to God? What questions do you want God to answer that you consistently ask? Of all those questions I asked of wrestling with God, I encourage you to keep wrestling with God. I don't think it's a bad idea. 
But I'll give you a warning. Those who wrestle with God, like Jacob, like me, they never leave the wrestling ring the same. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, we have heard the story of Jacob as he wrestled with you and how he asked for a blessing. There are many times in our lives where we wrestle with you and seek your blessing. As each of us here this morning wrestle with you, as we come to you with our fears, our doubts, our pains, our questions, as we grapple with both them and you, may you change us. Even if that change may hurt at first, help us know that through the pain comes healing. Help us trust you and, and allow you to guide us in our lives. Help us remember who is in control of creation, who holds all things together. And may Christ be the one who controls and drives our lives. O oh Lord, may you receive our thanks for all that is right and good and proper and shining with hope in our world and our lives. May you also hear our requests for all that seem wrong or bad, out of joint, and full of suffering. O oh God, may you be with the sick and those who help them. We pray that you comfort our loved ones who are feeling the effects of age. Be with and bless all in our society who have been cast to the side. Help us in both the church and those around us find food for the hungry and clothing for those who need it. May you soften the hearts of those who are full of hatred and spite. Help us all to love our neighbor as your son commanded, to see all human beings created in your image. Work through us so that your kingdom may be seen here on earth as it is fully realized in heaven. O oh, merciful God, we lift up to you all the prayers that are on our hearts and minds at this time. In your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, we offer all of these prayers to you, and we pray that you give us the strength to wait patiently for your answer and to live faithfully in response to your call. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art Let us join together in our closing hymn, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart. <clears throat>
as you leave this place today. May God's love sustain you, and may you love those who surround you. May God's spirit empower you, and may you empower all those whom you meet. May God's joy fill your hearts, and may this joy overflow to the ends of the earth for God's glory, both now and forever. Go in peace. Amen.